Um, it's good. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, we thank you for the ability that we can come together, Father, and, uh, and, and just, you know, learn from each other and love one another and um, just be with you, Lord. Um, Father, we ask that your spirit would just move over us today and um, that we be encouraged by your word. And, and, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, tell you how this message came about this morning. Um, a couple of days ago, I was riding in a truck in, in a van with John, and and it was just out of the blue. I, I, I had mentioned a message to John, and I'm like, uh, you know, he said, man, you ain't, never, you ain't never said anything about that. I'm like, really? So I told him about this message. And it's called the Trophies of Hell. And... Um, and after I got finished talking to him about it, you know, I mean, right afterwards, in a, I say not even, I wasn't even finished probably, the phone rings, and my brother's on the phone. So I'm, you know, we start talking for a minute, and, you know, I said, yeah, I'm just sitting here, and I was telling uh, John about the trophies of hell, and John told me I've never said it, and Jason told me, he said, man, he said, you've never ministered that message before. And um, he said, this is crazy because I was just telling Pete yesterday about it, about the trophies of hell. And, um, and so anyway, I, uh, I was, uh, I'm like, man, okay, Lord, you know, I guess that's what you want me to go with. And uh, so anyway, this was a serious time in my life that the Lord revealed this to me. Um, it was through another preacher. It was a Pentecostal pastor that preached this thing with fire, son. And it, it's exactly what I needed to hear at that time. Um, most of all you guys already know I was a drug and addictions officer. And um, it, was my, it was my thing, you know. And so for five years, you know, I was running up and down the interstate, you know, looking for stolen vehicles, illegal weapons, and narcotics. And it's what I poured my life into. Well, in the midst of all of that stuff, um, I led the county in drug rest for a couple of years in a row and wound up going through a whole bunch of other stuff. But anyway, um, in every drug bus I ever made, you know, on the interstate, it didn't matter where I was, um, I'd make them, you know, I'd put it out on the vehicle hood. They would stand next to it and I would take a picture of them or if I, you know, whatever I got them with. They would hold it like this, and I would take a picture of them. Well, I made a nice scrapbook, you know, and um, something that I was very, you know, proud of at the time. During this time, um, the Lord was, uh, I had had some dreams. He was uh, working in my life. This was in, in, in uh, April of 99. I had the dreams, but it was during the year between 99 and 2000, I believe. When the Lord was pulling me out of all of that and I heard this Pentecostal preacher preach on the trophies of hell and it, it rocked my world and uh, so I'm going to share a little bit you know a little bit of it with you and I'll tell you more about you know the drug and addictions and what happened but anyway um, I want to go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and we're going to start reading right there and this message, especially in the days that we're in right now, um, in the times that are coming, you know, um, it's not only the trophies of hell, but it's really the Lord has put in me the danger of drawing back, you know, and we're going to see what happens, you know, uh, we as Christians, you know, um, if we draw back. So let's get started. Father, we thank you. Lord, um, as we just read your word, Lord, I ask that your spirit, Lord, would just move over it and touch each and every body that's here today. And Father, I thank you for your word, your food that you've given us that we can live by and trust in and believe in. And Lord, you reveal all things and I thank you for it. So let's get started. I'm going to read a little bit today. I'm not going to scream and holler. I don't think. I'm not. I hope, well, I'll just let the Lord go from there. Let's, let's read. I'm going to pick up, this is, um, I'm going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is, King Saul has been anointed king, 
and um, Samuel anointed him. So he's the first king over Israel. And this whole deal was Israel needed, you know, they wanted a king. And so they rejected God. And uh, so God told Samuel to anoint uh, the son of Kish, which was Saul. And Saul, his name means little. But he was head and shoulders bigger than anybody else in Israel. So this Saul was, he was a big man. You know, he was probably about six foot six. You know, he wasn't no, he was head and shoulders bigger than anybody in Israel. Um, and they all wanted Saul as their king. So now you see how man looks at another man and, you know, you know, looking on the outer man. And we're going to get started. Samuel said unto Saul, and so Saul, before I get into it, he's already anointed king and, you know, now he's ruling. He ruled Israel for 40 years. And, um, and we'll find out what happened to Saul. It says, uh, Samuel said also unto Saul, chapter 15, verse 1, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek had did to Israel, um, and how they laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Um, this is when the children of Israel left Egypt, and Amalek had, you know, uh, you know, was this is the first one that they go to war with with Joshua. Remember that? And Moses got to keep his hands lifted up, right? So God is saying, hey, Saul, I remember how they laid wait for the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. He said, now I want to put an end to them 100%. Joshua whipped them. You know, when, when Aaron was on one side and Hur was on the other side holding up the, mo the arms of Moses, and Joshua goes to battle. And, uh, and now God is telling Samuel to go tell Saul, I want to put an end to these guys, you know, and uh, f because of what they did to my children. So now he says, uh, now Samuel tells Saul, go and smite Amlek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and camel and ass. Now you might think, that man, what kind of God is this that we're serving here? Because here it is, God is telling, you know, Saul to kill men, women, and children, and babies. I mean, that's kind of crazy, but if you don't understand and you don't know what's going on here, the Amleks and the Amalekites, they were giants. Their seed was of the seed of Satan that was passed down, like Goliath was nine foot nine. They was of the seed of Satan, literally. They were hybrids. So, um, you know, that's why God said, listen, go destroy the seed of Satan. That's why he said, kill men, women, and children. And a lot of people today doesn't understand that. Well, hey, God, you know, they read the Bible. Well, it says in Samuel, kill, killing babies and stuff. Well, if you find out, this is when, the, when the, the angels came down and slept with the daughters of men and produced giants in the earth. And we have skulls that, you know, today. So God is wanting to end that seed. You know, so it can't corrupt man like a corrupted man in the very beginning in the days of Noah. He wants to put an end to it. And it says, And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell them 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amlek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart you, get you down from uh, among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they had come up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the, Am uh, the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah um, until... Uh, Thou comest unto shore that is over against Egypt. If you remember when they left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. That was the first ones they encountered. So this is where this battle is going on over there. Um, and he took Agag, uh, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused uh, that they destroyed utterly. So basically God told Saul to go over there, kill Agag. Kill everybody that's there, men, women, and children, spare none, kill the cattle, lay that place waste and burn it, okay? So Saul goes over there and 
he looks, you know, through his eyes at the choicest, you know, sheep and cattle, and he takes them back, and, you know, he spares Agag, but he kills everybody else. And Agag is a giant. He spares Agag. But Saul and the people spared Agag. In verse 10 it says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that... Wow. Mm, mm, mm. Samuel's mother, Samuel's... Boy, no coincidence when you do something or you go someplace. Samuel's mother was Hannah. Yesterday, when we went on a job call out to, uh, to Homer, this young lady was very hospitable to, uh, to us. And she went and fixed us two monster burgers and fed us and, and didn't charge us or anything like that. And, you know, I, we got in a van and left. And it was a long story, but we had to go back to, um, we had to go all the way back to Homer because some, some things had happened with this water heater we, we installed and we didn't get home too late. But, you know, when I got in the van and I left, I didn't have any cash on me and I was thinking, you know, man, I wish, you know, I should have tipped that girl. Should have tipped her. You know, she was so good. Now, we working in the back of IHOPs installing the water heater and this girl, you know, is, you know, very pleasant. And she says, you want, yeah, it was around 12 o'clock. I said, man, can you guys fix us some lunch? I'll pay you for it, whatever it is. No, no, no. I'm going to fix your monster burger. And, and, and this girl came and fixed us up, you know. And, and um, so on the way, when we was going to get this part, we had to go back to home. We had to go back to Metairie and go back to home in the evening. And I'm thinking about, you know what, man, I didn't get the no, I didn't, I didn't tip her. I mean, I'm like, golly, I didn't pay for it. I could have gave her a good tip. I didn't have the money on, on me. So I borrowed the money from John. He has no idea. He didn't know. He has, he's finding out now what it was for. We at the plumbing place, and I'm like, John, you know, and he pulls out his wallet, and I got like $2 in my pocket, and he's, they start talking about money, and I'm thinking about the girl, about giving her a tip, and I'm like, John, loan me 10 No, I'll give you 100 I'm like, no, I don't want 100 I want 10 And then the guy says, well, if you need 10 you need 100 I said, I don't need 100 I need 10 So John gives me the 10 and when we go back, the girl's already gone, but I got with the manager and found out her name was Hannah. And I gave her 10. That's the law. Here it is. You never know. And I said, and when she said her name was Hannah, you know, I'm like, wow. I wish she would have been here so I can talk to her. You know, but, you know, it, it wasn't just the way God lays things out. But anyway, it just hit me right now when I'm reading this. Yeah, Agag. Hannah is, um, um, I, I, don't, I don't remember offhand, but I'll get to, I'll get to it. I, Hannah was barren, and she prayed. But anyway, um, and she has Samuel. Samuel, Hannah is Samuel's mother. She cried out for, to have a son. And God granted to her, and she said, I'll give him back to you, Lord. So Samuel was raised in... <coughs> And Samuel was raised in the house of the Lord. So anyway, so this is why he's God's prophet. He goes to anoint. So go back. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned his back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. This is no different for you and I today. You realize that, right? And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, set him up a place, and is going about, and passed on, and he's going to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then the bleeping of the sheep in my ears, and the, the lowing of the oxen in which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little, 
His name means little. Wow, Saul means little. When thou wast little, uh, uh, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them uh, until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey? Why you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil? That means you took the spoil, right? And did us evil in the sight of the Lord. And if you remember, this goes back to Joshua. When he crossed the Jordan, God said, Lee, destroy everything, and everything that's there belongs to me. Remember that? Yeah. Take nothing. But Achan took of the spoils of the Babylonian garments and the gold and the silver, and God utterly destroyed him. Remember? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He's still saying he obeyed. And have gone the way of the, in the way in which the Lord had sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekite, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. So the seed's not dead. Right. It's in the king. The, the, the worst one to bring back. Right. But the people took the spoil. He said, but the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord, the God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt does the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Is it not better to obey the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Amen. And to hearken than the fat of rams. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, I do this and I do that. And, but do you listen to what the Lord says? It's no different than, you know, well, I, I, do, I go to church and I do this and I do that. But are you following what it is the Lord calls you to do? On, tells you what to do. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now watch this. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And um, that's kind of crazy that rebellion is likened unto fortune telling. Huh? And stubbornness is, is sin and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being the king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Man, I'm going to stop right there. And because the times that we're living in right now, you know, Saul was commanded to do something. We're commanded to do something. But he was more afraid of the people. He feared the people. He feared the people more than he feared God. You know, and it's no different for you and I today. You know, we get all of this from, we get bombarded and we get told all kind of things. And we, we're more worried about what people say. And we kind of will walk that road of compromise instead of doing what it is that God has called us to do as Christians. You know, to walk for Him. To do His commandment. You know, but we're more, you know, well, our families are saying this and people are saying that. So you'll tend to compromise and then you're going to say, but yet, you know, God, I I'm still following you. Well, no, you're not. Right? So um, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 28. We're going to move ahead a little bit. And uh, I'm going to bring you to, um, this is where 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 7, this is... Uh, We'll start reading there. 28, Chapter 28, verse 7. So, we see that Saul has fell now. You know, and um, he was more worried about what people thought than what God had said. Oh, let me keep reading right. Let me, you, you go, to, go to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Now, Samuel is a prophet of God. And I'm going to go on. I'm going to read this, the rest of this little bit. But y'all stay in 1 Samuel chapter 28. He says, um, um, verse 25, I'm going to go back to 1 Samuel 15, verse 25, but you guys stay in 28. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, 
I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So the king, the kingdom is rent from him. And Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid hold upon the skirt and the mantle, and he rent it. He, he tore uh, Samuel's skirt, you know. Doesn't that sound familiar? Remember Amen. that David went in and cut the hem, cut the skirt of Saul. That was that was the the the, um, the witness that his kingdom was being taken away from, and God was raising up David, and he would be the one that took it. But anyway, um, it says um, in verse twenty nine, um, um, and also. It says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. So after he had told him the kingdom was going to be ripped away from him, you know, um, he's in front of the people, the people see it, and Saul's like, look, you know, so Samuel said, okay, because he's the prophet. He's going to make a sacrifice now, okay? Then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag. He's going to make a sacrifice. Bring to me Agag. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, bring me hither uh, Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and that means cheerfully, because he said, surely the bitterness of death has passed. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag into pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Remember, Gilgal, an altar was placed in Gilgal. Remember when Joshua crossed the Jordan. Now we're going to go to um, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 28. I'm doing a little reading today. Um, yeah, so you guys can get it, you know. 28 and verse 7. Um, he says, um, um, because I'm going to read um, right before verse 7. In verse 6 it says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams nor by the Urim or the Thurman, which is nor by the prophets. It's how the Lord spoke to him you know, before Jesus had come. So now, Saul is inquiring of the Lord, and he wants to hear from the Lord, but the Lord is not speaking to him because God has rejected him, right? So look what he does. Remember the rebellion is as witchcraft? Where does he go? Saul visits the witch. Verse 7, Then said, then said Saul unto the servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her, and his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit in Endor. Now let me tell you something about right there. This is a proven fact that, that Saul is in direct disobedience to God because God told Saul to kill every witch. Come on. Right? So now he's looking for a witch. And Saul disguised himself and put on... Why does he disguise himself? Because she knew that... She knew, witches knew, that Saul, if he found the witches, he would kill them. So listen what. And Saul disguised himself and put on uh, other remnant, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and said, I pray thee, divine unto me, call up by the familiar spirit, and bring uh, me him of whom I say unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off all those that have familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. Wherefore then uh, layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen unto thee for this thing. Wow. Watch. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Now, what you didn't hear between 15 and 27, that Samuel the prophet had died. Okay? And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out loud with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. She knew that Samuel was Saul's prophet. That's who talked to him. 
And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto me, What form is, is he of? Uh, and she said, Of an old man cometh up. And he covered, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. This is a familiar spirit, people. This ain't, is not Samuel. You understand that? That's what's going on today. You see these people that, you know, call in and get your fortune, these mystics that's on TV. This is not people from the dead. You know what I'm This is a familiar spirit that's been around them, you know, families through the ages, and they know. You're not talking to a dead relative or anything like that. You're talking to a, demon, a demon is what you're talking to. That's right. And, he, and it says, And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou dis, uh, disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answer me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Let me tell you something, man. Which you, you know, we we just don't catch here. Samuel is a prophet of God. How can a witch call up a prophet of God? He can't. He's gone. And you see why now. It says that Samuel, that the evil, it says, you know, a, a, an evil spirit from the Lord came and you know and tormented Saul. Because now he's you know, and David had to come and play for that evil spirit to leave. This is what he's dealing with now. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me? Why are you asking of me? Seeing the Lord has departed from thee, and is become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake to, by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand, and given unto thy neighbor, even unto David. This spirit knows. The spirit knows what's going on. Satan knows. That's exactly right. the word than we do. That's right. Because thou hast uh, obeyed not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon the Amalekites, the seed of Satan, therefore hath the Lord done this thing even unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow thou shalt, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the land, into the hand of the Philistines. Now when you go on, you find out that Saul died in Gilgal. That's right. The same place where, it, well, he actually died in Mount Gilboa. Right. My bad. And um, in, anyway, that's where he dies at. He rejected God and he, he's killed in Mount Gilboa, him and Jonathan and his sons. Okay. Now I want to go to... Uh, Can I say something? Yes. Um, I've heard it ministered before that uh, God allowed Samuel to go and talk with uh, Saul. But that can't be true because Saul, uh, because uh, Samuel, you know, naturally was a prophet, a child of God, a true prophet of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And here he's saying that Saul's children and grand Saul's children and grandchildren, which did not know the Lord, was going to be with him. So right, there ain't no way. Right, it's a it's he tells you. I mean, we just we stick with the word, and, and I've heard it said before too, you know, because it number one went to a witch. Right. Witches pull up familiar spirits, and the word there, it, he said he's perceived him to be. Well, why does so, it say the word of Samuel? Because the familiar spirit was 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 impersonating and repeating the words of Samuel. Yeah. It was not. It was not. Um, it definitely wasn't Samuel. It was a. Uh, it was definitely a familiar spirit, and that's where the the debate comes. The words of Samuel. Yeah. Well, the familiar spirit. It's no different than when you go to. You know, you get your fortune read or whatever it is, or you sit between, you know, by these people who, you know, you know, have a, a seance or whatever it is, or they call in these familiar spirits. You know, they start telling you things that your mom might have said to you, or you know, something that, and that's how it. But some 
Satan really speaks to them, right. and they they tell them things. Satan's telling them things, yeah, and you get to believe it because they'd have never known it. it. Right? Did you know that? You know? Right. Go ahead, Doug. Um, I, I remember under uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, some of the old people said that he thought a a soothsayer uh, in a decision yeah. when it came to the war and stuff. You know Abraham that? Lincoln did too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I heard Abraham Lincoln did, yep. That's right. And and God God specifically says, do not inquire of them. Because it's, you know, it's uh they know. They know they they're imitators. That's why it's called a familiar spirit. Yeah. And um so let's go on. Let's uh get to the, the heart of the message. Um first Samuel chapter thirty one. Um 1 Samuel chapter 31, and we're going to read. And this is going to tie into what the Lord had dealt with me on. And um, there's things that we, we do we don't even realize. So 1 Samuel chapter 31. 1 Samuel chapter 31. Gotta go further. There you go, right there. It says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchizu, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. And that word right there means that he was going to die. No matter, he was sore wounded. That was unto death. Then said Saul unto his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. You know, you see that today in Iraq when they, they get a soldier or something like that, they drag him through the streets and that's what he's talking about. But this armor-bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. So Saul killed himself. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Let me tell you something about a battle um, in those days that, you know, your, especially with the king, your armor-bearer was your armor-bearer. You, you don't turn your back on your armor-bearer. And it means if he dies, you die. That's how they were, they were the closest of friends they um, even closer than their wife. I mean, these you got to realize that these guys spent most of their time together. You go into a battle, um, you know, you got 30,000 men on one side and 30,000 on the other, and they run in. They're not running in with guns or shooting from a line. They're running in with battle axes. So when they fought, they fought back to back. And today, the Bible is discussed as the Holy Spirit being our rear reward, which is our rear guard, and that's how they fought back to back in a circle and they didn't leave that position because so you couldn't get stabbed in the back you know that's where that came man my friend stabbed me in the back where did that come from it came from there it came from those wars back then because you'll be fighting and then somebody stabbed you in the back with chance and that's why they always teamed up so Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all the men that same day together and when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent it into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols Come on. and among the people. So they cut, his, they cut their heads off and they sent it into their cities. It was a trophy. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall in Beth That's right. And when the inhabitants of, of Jabesh-Gilead 
heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshean and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. This message that this minister had preached was called the trophies of hell. And the way this guy, this, this, this Pentecostal preacher had done it was in his service when, when the people had walked in on the wall there was there was a deer head there were deer heads and there was fish and I mean just you know all kind of stuff that was hanging on the wall and he began to preach on and talk on the trophies of hell and how people take pride in their trophy I'm going to read the definition of trophy to you okay check this out a trophy is a cup or, an, or any other decorated object awarded as a prize for, the, for victory or success. In ancient Greece or Rome, the weapons and other spoils of a defeated army uh, was actually, was, it was used as a memorial victory. So whatever you got from the enemy, you would post it. And that's what they did with Saul, Saul and his sons. They took his bodies plastered it on a wall, took their armor into the, their gods of their temples and put it on a wall and carried around the heads around the city of Saul and his sons. They were trophies. It says, number three, it's anything that's taken in war or hunting or in competition, etc., especially when preserved as a memento or a spoil or a prize. You know, Today, we look at, you know, um, we look at, we go hunting and for the most part, it, just looking at a trophy, people go, man, I, I look, I don't shoot those. You know, I don't shoot no little bitty spikes. It's all about killing a big old rag. So they can put it on their wall and we can display it. Oh, look, I caught this nine pound bass. To put it on a wall because it, every time you walk in to somebody's house, they put it right in the middle of the peak or whatever it is so everybody could see, you know, this, this trophy bass or this trophy buck or these, you know, whatever kind of trophy they, they won golf in or whatever it might be, they put these trophies on display and it's pride to show victory. It's pride, yes. You know, you hear the term trophy wife, but really, that's no such thing because of, according to that definition, that you can't, it's something that's won or uh, from victory, you know, so you can't really have, uh, you can't put your wife as a trophy. I mean, it's that's right. a definition. That's right. It'd be something that you hunted for. That's a beautiful wife, don't get me wrong. Right. But there's no such thing as a trophy wife. You hear that, like football players, they got trophy model wives. No, he's got a trophy wife. Trophy wife, something you put on a match. Right. Well, it's just because the item that they put on display. You know, it basically it just comes down to, you know, it's just something that you put on display. You know, and uh, let me tell you something. You know, it, it's you could lose that trophy too. Sure. You know, so. Um, but the message is, you know, men, you know, today, they don't even, we don't even realize it, but the whole, I mean, I was just by somebody that, you know, killed a buck and he said, look, I, he was going to get it mounted, but it didn't have, you know, it wasn't a, a full eight point. It was a seven or a six. It wasn't, so I'm just going to do, you know, uh, another kind of mount and I'm not going to, you know, but it's all about putting something on display, you know, and it's pride. Then it goes back to when the Lord began to pull me out of this. You know, it was, I had a guy come over one day, and this was when I was, uh, when I was still um, doing drug and addictions. And um, he had come over by the house, I don't even remember who it was, and was in a kitchen in, in, in my house, and you know, I said, man, let me show you something. Oh, I know who it was, it was my brother-in-law, it was Scott. And um, I went and got my portfolio. And I opened that portfolio up, 
And I, I don't even know how many pitches I had in it, but he was a cop too. You know, I'm like, man, look at this, Scott. And I'm going through that magazine. You know, I'm like, man, look at this. I got this guy here, I got this guy there, and I'm going through it, and look at this, you know, and I'm just going through the pitches. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I saw their eyes for the first time in my life when I was standing there. And I wasn't looking at the drugs no more. I was looking at, they was they, like this, you know, leaning over in, 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 my, in my police car, like this with their drugs in their hands, you know, and, or on a hood, and they leaning over the hood, and the drugs are all over the, the, the hood of the car. And I'm, I pose for me so I can take a picture because I got you as a trophy. <laughs> and that's what I did. I put them on display. And one day I'm going through that book and I heard that message. And when I opened that book, the Lord told me, you're full of pride. And you're looking at the outside and you think you're doing good. But you don't see them as I see them. And He showed me their eyes and I looked in their eyes and I looked inside of them and the Lord said, you don't even know where they come from. You don't even know what they've been through. And you're going to put them on display like you did something good? First time in my life, I took that book and I threw it in the garbage can and repented. Repented. Had to ask the Lord to forgive me. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to back up. I'm going to show you another trophy. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 54. Real quick. Um, this is when David goes out against Goliath. Remember that? In verse 54 it says, And David took the head of the Philistine. Man, it's something, huh? It's all about the head. It's all about the head. Oh, yeah, I let the little one, you know, with those horns, the little, you know, four point, I just let him walk by. It wasn't big enough for me to kill. I'm waiting for the big boy to come out. I hunt horns. You know, I mean, think about it. I took horns and put them in the oven. I, first, I boiled them for about two hours, and I put them in the oven for about four hours. And when I took them out, they were still tough. I couldn't eat them. That's when I stopped hunting horns. <laughs> Listen to this. But it's all about, it's really all about a trophy. It's all about a trophy. We do it, and we don't even realize what we're doing. And David took the head of the Philistine, and he brought it up to Jerusalem. Why? We know he buried it there, it says. But he had a trophy. He killed a giant that was nine foot nine. Nine foot nine. You realize that? Look at the beam right there. That's how big he was. Right? How high is the beam right there? What's that? What, what is what? That's 12 over there. That's 12 foot right there? Okay. Half that. You know. To the door. The roll of the door. I mean, think about that. Going against a man that's about 500 pounds and he's that big. Do you think you have a chance? Can you imagine what his head weighed? Wow. So David carried that head and all of Israel, they feared Goliath. For 40 days Goliath called out in that valley, send me out a man and let us fight. And David was only 17 years old. He was only 17. So, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put the armor in his tent. So he took a trophy, but he buried it. And I ain't going to get into the message with that. It was for a reason. I remember when the Lord gave me uh, this message. I was working with the Sheriff's Department. I'm just reading my notes. And I had a book, and I had trophies. And the Lord told me I was full of pride. Little did I know, little did I know, but I was the actual trophy. I was the trophy. You don't realize it. 
but you're the trophy. And I'm going to tell you something about the enemy. The enemy, he loves to kill big bucks. Yeah. You are a trophy to the enemy. And if he gets you, he's going to hang you up on his wall and put you on display. And you know, if you've been in the Lord a long time, well, then your horns are big. And that's why he's after you. But if you just come in with the Lord, oh, he's out to get you, but you're not a trophy. But he'll take you if he can. This all goes back to Lucifer. The trophies of hell. Saul was a trophy to Satan. And he put him on display, he hung him on his wall, put his armor in his temple, hung his heads and his sons up, and put him on display. He was a man of God. A king. Or aren't you and I call kings and priests? And once you accept the Lord, well then you become a trophy. You become a trophy. Think about how Saul became a trophy. Rebellion. He didn't do what God called him to do. He was more concerned about what people thought rather than what God said to do. Man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to say this. Knowing in your heart it's the right thing to do. But you're more, you would rather please man than please God. You really don't want to please man, but you know, you want to please God, but you don't want to offend man. So you can't talk about things like, you know, whatever it might be, Christmas <laughs> or whatever. You can't talk about, you know, um, whatever it is. Mardi Gras or Easter or any of that stuff. Well, I can't, you know, separate myself from doing this or doing that. What's wrong with me from, you know, doing this? When it's rebellion. And rebellion is as witchcraft. And you'll be rejected. You will be rejected. I'm sorry, there's not one saved, always saved. It doesn't exist. Amen. Let's go to um, 2 Peter. Let me go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and I'm going to end with this. Because the times that we're living in right now, and the reason I'm giving you this message, the whole reason I'm giving you the message, 2 Peter, it's in the New Testament. 2 Peter. The reason I'm giving you this message right now is because it's not going to get easier as we go. It's going to get harder. And remember I told you, I told you about the trophies of hell. But Peter talks about the danger of drawing back. Because if you draw back, you're sure enough going to be a trophy. You know how to get them, right? You put the food out. You put the corn out. You put whatever it is that you know, you know they're going to come to. Second Peter warns us. Listen to this. Second Peter chapter uh, 2. And I'm going to start... Um, See where I'm going to start. Second Peter chapter two. I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start in, in in verse fifteen. Let me go up. No, I'm going to go up a little higher. I'm going to go to verse thirteen. And it says. Uh, He's talking about false teachers, okay? And he says this. Amen. Verse 14, see? 
having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetousness practices, their cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray. That means they were doing what was right, like Saul. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, they loved money, but was rebuked for his sin by the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice. He forbade the madness of the prophet. The, the dumb ass spoke to him and said, what are you doing? It was all over money. He says, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, of pride, they allure through the lusts of the flesh through much wantonness. Remember Saul? They didn't, you know, they, the army went in there. Oh, they saw the best sheep. Amen. Are we going to take that and give that an offer to God? No, they wasn't. They was going to keep it for themselves. Those that were clean. Let me go back to verse 18. For they speak great swelling words of vanity. They allure through the lusts of the flesh through women, through money, through objects, through possessions, anything that will draw us away from the Lord. Anything that draws our flesh away from God will automatically make you a trophy. And you are setting yourself up for it. You realize that? What is it good? Is it what, what does it, why would a Christian go to a bar? Oh, I'm just drinking one beer. Somebody walks in and wastes everybody in a bar. And you get blown away. Right. Right. Then you got to stand before God. And give account for that. Well, you wasn't right. Through much wantonness, those that were clean, they were clean. They have escaped from them who live in error. So they once were clean. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. That's the flesh. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Either you're going to be overcome by Jesus Christ, or you're going to be overcome by the world. You realize that. Either it's going to be through money, oh man, I don't want to say anything, you know. It's either going to be through money, or possessions, or women, or drugs. You're going to be overcome by that. Amen. That is going to lead you straight to hell. It says the latter end. You know, the latter end is worse with them. Who is them? Them that has accepted Jesus Christ, has already been made clean, and now has turned away. You see, because once you've accepted Jesus Christ, there's a mark on you. And Satan is out to get you so that you can become his trophy. The worse for them, it's worse with them than the beginning. Next verse. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of, un the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now, I don't know how people believe and get once saved, always saved, when that is point blank. That's right. God rejected Saul. Jesus said not one jot a tittle. It ain't an Old Testament. It's an Old Covenant. But now the New Covenant, God doesn't deal with the outer man. He says now if you lust for a woman in your heart, that's what he'll judge. So it's been enhanced to the spirit now. But it has happened unto them, to them according to the true proverb which Solomon spoke. The dog is turned to its own vomit again. Turned to the vomit again. 
and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Next verse. That's it? Yeah, chapter 3, verse 1 now. Okay. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul then begs Samuel to pardon his sin, and Samuel said, I will not, because he feared the people more than God. The message today is the time is coming when you're going to have to make a decision. That's right. It's not getting easier to walk with the Lord. It's getting harder. Now either you're going to fear God or you're going to fear man. And Jesus had said, you know, don't fear what man can do unto you, but fear God, who can destroy both the, the soul, the spirit, and the body. That's right. Where man can just kill the flesh. So the dangers of falling back, you'll become a trophy to the enemy. And most people today can't even stand up and make a stand for Jesus Christ because they fear the people more than they fear God. They can't stand up and say, you know what, no. You know, I'm not going to Mardi Gras. No, I'm not drinking. No, I'm not taking part of that. No, I'm not. But because of people that are standing around them, if it's passing a joint, Amen. they got that, that intimidation factor. What are they going to think about me? Well, they take. I'm telling you, it's not going to get any easier to serve the Lord. And let me tell you something. If you reject Him, you will be rejected. That's why the Lord says, If you confess me before people, I will confess you before my Father. Amen. And let me tell you something. It just said in 2 Peter that those that was washed clean... Those that were washed clean and has returned into the vomit and the wallowing in the mire again, the darkest, most severest part of hell is reserved for us if we fell back. Because he said it's better that you've never known to have known and walk away from him. Yeah. You realize that? Yeah. Is it any better for someone who has not known the Lord? Not really, because eternally you'll be burning and separated from God. You understand that? Amen. Man, make a stand for Jesus Christ now while you can. Because if you can't do it now, you won't do it later. I'm telling you. Right. Right. You realize that? Right. Most people say, oh, I'll never, never, you know, forsake Jesus. I asked the people in the prison, how many of you guys would die for Jesus? Everybody, about 20, 25 people in there, in that jail cell, with all those cells come together. When I was ministering, and Jason bear witness, 32 people. I asked them, how many people in this jail cell will die for Jesus Christ? Every single one of them raised their hand. And I said, you know what? God doesn't want you to die for Him. He wants you to live for Him. And if you can't live for Him now, you won't die for Him later. The hands went down. Because it's only by the Spirit of God. You see, the want is there. The want is there. We want to we we say that we could serve God. We want to say that we could die for Him. But it's not in the ability of man to die for God. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit living in you that will enable you to go through something like that Amen. if you're called to do that. Right. Amen. Live for Him now with everything you got. Make a stand. 
People are more worried about offending the people in their own house when Jesus Christ said, those of your own house will be your enemy. Amen. They will turn you in. They will turn you in. Absalom, the son of David, tried to kill him. That's right. Judas betrayed Jesus after being with him three and a half years. You think a person who is not, who is not, you know, has the Holy Spirit living in him, here's a man that walked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years and betrayed him. Peter Chu betrayed Jesus Christ. It wasn't until the Holy Spirit came in him that he was able, uh, you know, to say, I'm not worthy to be crucified like this. Turn me upside down. Amen. People don't realize that they are walking trophy. It's worse for them. Oh, well, Lord, I didn't want to offend my brother. You know, because he doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that. So, you know, don't you realize that you are a light? You are supposed to be revealing the darkness that they're walking in. That's right. If you don't shine bright, how are they going to know that they're living in sin and you will be held accountable for it? Right. Did not make you a light into this world to be put on display because the light reveals the darkness. Oh no, I'm going to dim it down a little bit so they can't see their sin. And I'm going to walk in their sin with them. Ah! Be what God has called you to be. Make a stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't tell me you love Jesus and do something else. Because you're a hypocrite. It's time to be a light. It's time to do what God has called us to do. And guess what? You're going to offend your mama. You're going to offend your daddy. You're going to offend your brothers and sisters. You're going to offend your uncles and your aunts. And they're going to reject you. Yeah. Because that's what the Bible said. They rejected me. They're going to reject you. Those in Jesus Christ's own household, household didn't believe he was the Son of God until after the resurrection. We know that in, Ju in James and Jude. That's crazy. I'm telling you now, people, it's going to get harder because the government and all the things, the world that's happening out there right now, son, there's a separation that's happening right now in the world and there's a decision coming that you're going to have to make. Either you're going to be a part of it or you're not. God knows how to separate. But I'm telling you right now, now is the time to make that decision. So that you can do what it is that God has called you to do. It's not about your salvation. It never was about you. So get you out of the center. Die so that others can be saved. You understand that? Amen. It's not about you. You your own trophy. <clears throat> because I'm telling you, the Bible says that the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right. And he will hang your head on his wall. You understand? Walk for Jesus, man. If you don't know him, you need to know him. You need to accept him. If you need to repent, David did things that wasn't right and he repented. He fell down on the ground. It's a difference between what David did and Saul did. You might not think, oh, so God commanded Saul to do something. And Saul went into utter rebellion and didn't do it. David fell into sin. Committed murder. Killed Uriah the Hittite. Slept with his wife. Impregnated her. But he hit the ground. 
He said, may I fall in the, the hands of the Lord. But Saul was in utter rebellion. And I'm going to tell you something. The new covenant that's been given to you and me, we're called to be a light to the world. And if you ain't that light, you're in rebellion. So either you're going to give into the flesh and hold your addictions, or you're going to begin to confess them and begin to ask the Lord to help you, and you're going to make a stand for what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Understand that. There's no compromise. You can't compromise the seed of God, the Word of God. You can't. It's really easy. First thing, in order to be saved, John and I talked about this. What is salvation? Number one, how do you know if you're saved or not? Well, I'm not going to tell you. All you have to do is walk down this little aisle and come stand up here and ask Jesus Christ in your life to be your Lord and Savior, and now you have eternal life because that's a bunch of baloney, son. That is baloney. You need to understand and know that you are a sinner and you need a Savior and there is absolutely nothing you can do as an individual to be saved. Your good works, your performance, your good deeds, your millions you give to the poor, whatever it is that you do, even if you died for somebody else, if you do not have Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. You have to realize that Jesus Christ is the only way. That He paid for your sin. That you are a sinner and need a Savior. Until you recognize that, you're not saved. I don't care how many times you've prayed. I don't care how many times you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. Amen. Because when you realize that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, let me tell you something. When God revealed to me, it broke me down, son. Broke me down. And you know a true confession because it doesn't come from the mouth, it comes from the heart. And you realize how nasty and pathetic and that my God, like I said last week, taking me from the from the from the from that, wallowing in the mire, in the muck, and having part in all of that junk, has picked me up and said, you know what? I'm gonna make you brand spanking new and you ain't gonna be the same person anymore. That is like, how do you even comprehend that? He makes all things new. Exactly like being born over as a little bitty baby again. You cannot be saved. You cannot, unless you realize that you're a sinner and you need a savior. If you don't understand that, then tell Jesus. Say, look man, I don't, I don't fully understand it. I don't understand, I don't, you know, I haven't, I don't know him like that. I don't, I don't understand what he is that he's saying. But help me. Right. If you ask him to help you, right. he will reveal himself to you. Right. That is a fact. I went to church a long time and didn't understand Jesus. Until one day, you know, it just opened up and I saw. Salvation comes through confession with the mouth. But that confession can't come unless it's coming from the heart. So I don't care how many times you walk up the alley or the aisle or come to the altar, unless you meet him, you know, unless you know and have met him heart to heart, you don't want to meet him face to face. Because, you know, the opportunity that's been given us is that either we're going to allow Christ to pay for the things that we've done or we're going to pay for them. So either you can die to self 
and give it all over to Jesus Christ so that when you die, you don't have to pay for the sins that you've committed. Because Satan, your adversary, he's not your advocate, he's your adversary. He's working against you. So when you stand before the Lord, he's going to say, hey, that guy right there? Hmm. <clears throat> Last night, he was doing some pretty wicked things there, Lord. And look, I got all my little witnesses, my demons right here, all my little, you know, in fact, you know, Delta, what was he doing last night? Oh, oh, he, oh. And when you look to the other side for your representation, the advocate, and he's not standing over there, well, then you're in trouble. That means you're going to court with no attorney no advocate it's just you and the judge and there's only one place for you salvation alone comes by Jesus Christ uh, 10 10 for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness that word believes means to hear and follow Jesus to serve him and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And the name of the Lord is Yeshua, is Yahweh, and it means salvation shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that's where it lies at. In faith alone, in faith alone, in God alone, in His Word alone. I'm going to tell you this one last thing. Check this out. I heard this was really good. Real eyes. Real eyes. Real eyes. Real lies. Real eyes. Real eyes. Real lies lies from the enemy you understand father we thank you lord if you don't know jesus christ and you want him man it's open to you all you have to do is ask him father show me you know let's uh let's just pray let's pray together you know if uh if god's tugging on your heart you know you can uh you can, you know, just repeat a prayer. You know, you ready? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we realize, Father, that you're our Savior. And Lord, I remember when I realized that I was a sinner in darkness, Father, and, and, and living just for the lust of, of what I wanted. And Lord, you revealed the light to me. Today, Father, I ask by your Holy Spirit, Lord, if there's any that's here, that your Spirit, Father, would move over them so that they can see, Father, and that they would realize who you are. Father, that you are the God that loves us. And Father, you're not, you don't send anyone to hell, Father. When the enemy came in a long time ago and deceived man and went into sin, that was something the enemy did. It was perfect in your creation. But Father, you have given us a way out. And our way out is through Jesus Christ, your Son. It's, it's like a ship passing in the water for someone who's drowning. 
It isn't the, the ship's fault that the person is drowning, but off of that ship comes this life preserver, and that life preserver is Jesus Christ. And Father, that's exactly what it is to you. You are offering us a life preserver, a life raft that will save us, Father. So Father, we thank you, Lord. And Lord, I remember when I was a sinner, you know, and you revealed yourself to me and I needed to save your Father. I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, Father. Like your word says, confess with your mouth. Father, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And your word says, Father, that when we hear the truth, we'll know it. And your truth is the word and that truth will set us free. Free from what, Lord? Free from death and destruction. Free from the world and its sin. Free us from the cage that we live in, Lord. Does things get easy? No. They get better, though. And Father, your word says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But, and that's where, Father, your word is so awesome that once we confess our sin to you, and we realize that Jesus, by His blood, is the only way. And we confess Jesus as our Savior. Lord Jesus, You are my Savior. That, Father, You sent us Your Spirit to come and live inside of us, which now helps us on our road back. We have something now that's living inside of us that can help us move forward. Does it mean, Father, that we're never going to sin again? No. Does it mean that we'll never fall again? No. It means that... It's by your power and by your spirit, if we fall, we can get back up again and start walking. Yes. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move over them and just begin to talk to them and teach them. And, and Father, whatever it is they need, Lord, I just ask that you would... Um, Lord, just give it to him, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Love you guys.